Russia's war in Ukraine has driven a surge in global energy and food prices. And while governments are focusing on economic recovery following the devastating COVID-19 pandemic, many are still finding it difficult to keep warm and put three meals on the table. Trade and union workers going on strikes to demand higher wages are becoming a widespread global phenomenon. Here in Seoul, where strikes were common, thousands of truck drivers left their posts in December, forcing the South Korean government to take an unprecedented move. Yu Che An, a union leader, locked himself in a cage on the floor of an oil tanker. This was during a strike in July 2022 at the Teo shipbuilding in Koje. In June, thousands of truck drivers also went on strike for one week, demanding a minimum wage system known as the Safe Trucking Freight Rate System be permanently set up. The strike ended after the government said it would discuss the issue. But with no agreement in sight, truckers again in December stopped working. This time, it lasted for more than two weeks, costing more than 2.7 billion U.S. dollars in production losses as work at construction building sites came to a halt. For President Yoon song yeol it was the second major industrial dispute since it took office in May. He denounced the strike, saying strikers were holding the country hostage and threatening the economy. And he likened the industrial actions to what North Korea's missiles were doing to South Korea. He made it clear he would not tolerate these illegal actions. So for the first time ever, he issued an executive order, the return to work order forcing them to return to work or face jail terms of up to three years and even lose their licenses. With no choice, truckers on December 9th called off the strike and were back behind their wheels. Except for the union leader. A tent was set up outside the National Assembly for union leader Yi Bong-ju, who went on a hunger strike this winter. He said it was important for all unions to take collective action. But it won't be easy for workers in South Korea under President Yoon's tough line stance. And truck drivers know this only too well. Now I'm here in Incheon, west of Seoul, to meet one of the truck drivers who are on strike in December. 아저씨 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. 네. 그럼 제가 거기에서 같이 파도 될까요? 네. 
Park Kyung Soo has been driving trucks for about 27 years now. His day starts very early. Mr. Park says with the minimum wage system in place, he takes home about 4 million won, about 3,100 US dollars on the average. That's if he's lucky and can sometimes get two jobs in one day. 4 million won, he says, is not a lot for a family of four these days. But if it wasn't for the minimum wage system, he would be making much less. After driving for about two hours, he arrives at his destination. Okay, now that he's done here, he's going to go back to Incheon, where he came from this morning to drop off this container. And he'll be there waiting, hoping that he'll be able to get another assignment this afternoon. Professor Kim Sung-hee of Korea University Graduate School of Labor Studies says there are no proper systems in place to prevent industrial actions, although labor management relations have been institutionalized in the country for some time now. Experts agree the government must find a long-term solution for many of the labor issues, including those of the truck workers, as workers' discontent spreads across the country, threatening to undermine the country's already weak economy. Kim Dae-jong, a business professor at Sejong University, believes that President Yoon plans to nip these industrial actions in the bud by pushing for labor reform. It was an unprecedented move for the government to force workers to return to work in a country where strikes are common and sometimes very violent. It remains to be seen if labor discontent will grow in 2023 and how the government plans to meet the pay demands amid soaring food and commodity prices. After the break, we'll look at how the U.S. pulled off a narrow escape from an economic disaster over a rail strike. US government has made it illegal for railroad workers to go on strike. In December, thousands of employees said that they would walk out unless they were given paid sick leave, better pay and better working conditions. Experts say that a strike like that could be disastrous for the US economy.
Railroads have played a huge part in America's history. According to the American Railroad Association, freight trains are responsible for moving 40% of the country's long distance volume. The ARA also says they're three times more fuel efficient than using trucks. But some workers in the industry have been unhappy for some time. One of those is Matt Weaver, a carpenter in Ohio and a BMW ED rail union member. He's been in the industry for over a decade used to be some of the best paid with best benefits around occupation for an industry and um, inflation's really given us a hit. And then in my whole career, we've not had paid sick days. And having worked in the industry for as long as you have, um, how does it make you feel to you know not have the paid sick leave that, that you mentioned? Well, the, the whole scenario was, um, emboldened by a pandemic where the railroad was telling us we were, you know, we were um, essential and they're giving us papers to give to the to law enforcement if there's a quarantine. And then when it comes to um, bargaining, we're, we're expendable. You know, that that's disheartening. Um, but, oh, we need you to keep America's commerce flowing, but you can't have a sick day because uh, the shareholders won't be happy. You know, what, what the hell is that? Thousands of workers like Matt were prepared to strike. But in September, the U.S. government, rail unions and rail company executives seemed to have reached a deal. Because of the labor agreement, those rail workers will get better pay, a 24% wage increase over the next five years, improved working conditions, peace of mind around their health care by capping the cost that workers will have to pay. But after this announcement, negotiations stalled. Rail workers gave the US government until December the 9th to give them exactly what they were asking for. If not, they'd go on strike. But in early December, the US government passed a bill here in Congress to make any rail strike across the country illegal. President Joe Biden says that averted a certain catastrophe, one that would have put thousands of Americans out of work. A rail strike could be an economic disaster for the US, cancelling thousands of deliveries, commuter train journeys, and costing the government an estimated $2 billion a day. Rail shutdown would have devastated our economy. Without freight rail, many of the US industries would literally shut down. In the event of a shutdown, my economic advisors report that as many as 765,000 Americans, many of them union members themselves, would have been put out of work for the first time and excuse me, within the first two weeks of, this, of the strike alone. Experts say the U.S. government needs to keep a hold on the issue. Well, there's only so much the president can do where there isn't legislation like freight rail in terms of getting involved in in uh, strikes between private organizations, private unions, and private businesses. So I would anticipate that the president would continue to try to mediate, uh, but not really try to, I think, get vocally involved in picking one side or another. There is still no sick leave included in the bill, but President Biden maintained he will continue to fight to get rail workers the right to paid sick leave, because if rail workers were to strike, the economic impact would be felt right across. America. Belgium has been no stranger to strike action in recent months. 2022 saw the country's top trade unions declare at least half a dozen nationwide days of protest or industrial action. Double digit inflation across the European Union amid the fallout of Russia's war in Ukraine means people's wages don't stretch as far as they used to. In December, tens of thousands took to the streets of Brussels to demand more government support. Amid price surges, protesters here say the pressure on their purchasing power is too much to bear. We would like to see decisions who really make the difference, because now they are uh, measures they make, but uh, the people are still hungry, the people can't pay their bills. Well, on these workers' wish list, major reforms including a cap on rent costs and a big boost to minimum wages. 
But as energy inflation runs at around 40% year on year, it's the battle to keep up with gas and electricity costs which is sparking most distress, and not only for those in low paid work. After a series of spring, summer and autumn actions, trade union members are now shivering through cold weather walkouts. It is well below freezing. We are really in the depths of winter here. And as you can see, this pond has actually frozen over. But demonstrators seem undeterred. They say they will keep showing up until things change. These successive strike days have been slowing down Belgian life. Hundreds of international flights were cancelled in 2022 and some metro lines ground to a halt. Though Belgian authorities stand accused of doing too little, Prime Minister Alexander de Croo insists his government has made significant progress and points to laws which link salaries to inflation, meaning wages rise automatically as prices increase. All studies show that the purchasing power of the Belgians is actually the best protected if you compare it to other countries. We have reduced the VAT on electricity, we have introduced the basic package, we have a social tariff which is applicable to 20% of, uh, of the population. So a lot of things have been, uh, have been done. Unlike in France or Germany, Belgium has chosen not to limit households' energy bills at a national level. Instead, it pushed all European Union countries toward a block-wide gas price cap to curb the extreme spikes witnessed since Russia invaded Ukraine. Though the Netherlands and Germany argued this could see gas shipments sold to higher bidders elsewhere and leave Europe in the lurch, EU energy ministers crafted a compromise in mid-December after months of debate. This unprecedented market measure will be enforced from February. Belgium's government believes its bet on an EU-wide cap will pay off eventually. In the meantime, many Belgian citizens face a struggle just to pay off their bills. After the break, we'll look at how the UK is responding to its new winter of discontent. Icy temperatures in central London weren't enough to keep these National Health Service nurses away. Tens of thousands of them walked out of their wards and onto the streets in the lead up to Christmas. It was the first industrial action of its kind after talks between government ministers and union bosses over paying conditions broke down. Staff continued to provide some urgent care during the strikes, but routine services were disrupted. It is stunning what I've seen in 40 years in my career, the collapse of the, you know, the best institution I've ever worked in to one that is just barely capable of delivering core services now. I mean, it really is heartbreaking and it's, it's on the government's hands. Nurses say they are physically and mentally depleted, working around the clock to make up for the almost 50,000 vacancies across the profession. Many healthcare professionals like Dave Carr were on the front line during the COVID-19 pandemic. Then came the war in Ukraine, bringing record high energy and heating bills. This nurse in southwest England asked not to be named out of fear of reprisals. Working long and exhausting shifts, she is one of many nurses considering leaving the industry altogether. If I could do things over again, I wouldn't be a nurse, which does sadden me because I love, I love caring for the patients. Um, it's an interesting job, but I think the pressures are becoming too much and I think nurses are becoming burnt out because nurses give, give and give. Uh, we take care of people, but I kind of think, well, I'm not quite sure who is taking care of us. Other workers share this frustration. Telecommunications staff and postal workers have been out on picket lines intermittently since the summer. They walked out after inflation reached a 40-year high. In December, they were back on strike, refusing to deliver letters during one of the busiest times of the year for the postal industry. Workers here say they want a pay rise to match the soaring cost of living, but they say neither their employers nor the government are listening. The Communication Workers Union says its members are struggling to stay afloat, with some forced to use food banks to survive. The working class, we've had enough. There's never enough for us, but there's always enough for them. And they come in and they take and they take and they take. So 
We don't have any other option, really. Widespread train strikes meant many people's Christmas plans were stopped in their tracks. Visits to see friends and family were cancelled, and commuters faced long and difficult journeys. They are fighting for what they want, and um, we are supporting them, but it's affecting us uh, tremendously. And I think, I mean, uh, the responsible authorities have to sit down with um, uh, um, the train drivers and um, find a solution to this. It cannot be going on forever like what is going on. The government implemented plans to minimise disruption, for example, training military personnel to drive ambulances to cover striking paramedics. But that's not a permanent solution. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says unions' demands for inflation-matching pay rises are unaffordable. So hard-working families right now in this country are facing challenges. The government has been reasonable. It's accepted the recommendations of an independent pay body, giving pay rises in many cases higher than the private sector. But if the union leaders to continue to be unreasonable, then it is my duty to take action to protect the lives and livelihoods of the British public. Some ministers warn higher wages could lead to a wage price spiral, where higher costs for consumers make inflation worse. But Carl Thompson from the Centre for Economics and Business Research says this is not likely to happen. Earnings are rising at about 6 percent, whereas if you look at inflation, that has been sort of 10, 11 percent. So um, in terms of existing data, we, we, we don't see evidence of, of uh, pay rises in excess of inflation, which really would point to a wage price spiral. Whether striking workers get the pay rise or not, this season of industrial action has taken an unprecedented toll on hospitality venues. Without trains running, customers couldn't get to restaurants, bars, theatres or hotels which saw mass cancellations during the festive season, costing those businesses thousands of pounds at a time when things were already difficult. Our costs are through the roof. Um, energy crisis has hit us massively as a business uh, with triple electricity and heating at the moment. Um, staff costs uh, have gone up uh, and beer costs, wine, everything across the board is, is up. He says the rail strikes in particular hit his business hard and he's worried for the future of the entire industry. This industrial gridlock has put the country's economic recovery on the back foot. Facing a storm of industrial action, the likes of which haven't been seen since the 1970s, many workers, commuters and business owners alike say it's up to the government to bring Britain's new winter of discontent to an end.